Well, good afternoon, everyone. This presentation is going to involve a little personal history, um, a discussion of some interesting projects, and then we're going to tie everything into the next generation science standards, which are uh, important here in California, since they're being implemented, I believe, next year. So, my world changed on October 4th, 1957. That was the day Sputnik went up. And it just captured the imagination of millions of people around the world. The idea that we had an artificial moon going around the Earth. <clears throat> and uh, those of us in school who were interested in this uh, were called rocket boys. Um, no offense, but at that time, not many young ladies were interested. And I went to a school that was 6,000 boys and no women, so we were definitely rocket boys. <clears throat> and this picture was taken at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, where I was at the time. Um, I draw attention to the pocket protectors. You know, we took care of ourselves in 57. And the Chicago Tribune wanted to take this picture during the day because the light was better. So obviously, we're not looking at anything. <clears throat> but it made a nice photo moment. By 1961, um, I had started building, well, certainly in 57, I started building a scrapbook I still have of newspaper clippings. And in 1961, I had designed a instrument package that was about one foot cube filled with electronic devices I had designed and soldered together to make all kinds of measurements um, and didn't have rockets handy, not that that would have helped, so we used weather balloons instead. And that project was launched from the front lawn of my high school, which is shown, shown here, uh, Lane Tech High School in Chicago. Uh, the second oldest public school in the city. <clears throat> so this, uh, this weather balloon uh, carried the package up pretty high. We used amateur radio to communicate, get the data back, and uh, landed in a farmer's field, and he graciously mailed the package back to us. And I took first place in the Illinois State Science Fair, and that was kind of cool. And Norma found this certificate when she was going through the house the other day. I didn't even know I still had this. So it all, um, it all worked out. And I, met, I tell this story because you'll see it connecting to what's going on today in some very nice ways. I love this quote from Neil Armstrong who said, I think we're going to the moon because it's the nature of the human being to face challenges it's by the nature of his deep inner soul uh, we are required to do these things just as salmon swim upstream. And this idea of curiosity is a very important characteristic of human beings, and we need to find ways to support that. And it's not just grown-ups who are curious, as you know. I mean, young kids from birth are curious about their world and try to make sense of it and whatnot. And as educators, we have an opportunity to help them do that. So, going back to 61 for a second, I had a 25 centimeter cube, all handmade circuits, lots of soldering and hardware design, and a balloon launch. Today, we're going to talk about satellites that students can use, program here on Earth, send the programs up to the satellite, it will gather data and send it back to the students. This is pretty cool stuff. And the project is perfectly compatible with next generation science standards, common core math, and STEM education in general. Now I want to talk a little bit about disruption disruptive technologies, and how they can change the world. <clears throat> Back when I first started using computers, sort of the mother ship was the IBM 360. 
And I was lucky to have access because I was at a major university when this machine came out. But if I wanted to have computer access from home, it didn't exist. And there were people at the time who said, you know what, computers are too important to just leave in the hands of, of corporations, of, of uh, universities, of banks, and that people should have computers. And the disruption that came was a democratization of computing, uh, typified by uh, example, uh, the Apple II, okay? And the other personal computers of the late 70s. So computing got democratized. The reason I tell that little tidbit of history is for the following. This is a photograph of Landsat 8. It's the satellite that has been sending us back these lovely pictures of, of Hurricane Patricia. And uh, that satellite cost $850 million uh, to uh, build and get up into orbit. Anyone want to guess the likelihood of a high school student being able to run a project on that satellite? If the number zero comes to mind, raise your hands. Yes, you're right. So, wouldn't it be nice if space was democratized? Well, the democratization of space has happened through the creation of CubeSats. CubeSats are 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, usually, um, of satellites, and I'll talk about how they get launched and everything in a little bit. Uh, by the way, that size, 10 by 10 by 10, came about because one of the developers of the concept uh, had a daughter who collected Beanie Babies, and one of the boxes Beanie Babies came in, happened to be 10 centimeter cube, and he thought, that's a good size for a satellite. So, you see, everything has a reason. It just may not make sense. But there it is. Uh, this is a picture of three CubeSats being pushed out from the International Space Station. Now, the satellites that we're talking about today are computationally a hundred times more powerful than the first Mars rover. I mean, we all know about the exponential growth of technology power, right? But just, you know, keep that in mind. So how did this all come about? Well, there were three guys at NASA Ames on the other side of the, you know, in the peninsula who had lunch. And one of them said, you know, there is more power in one of these smartphones than there is in most satellites. So why don't we just send one of these up? And so they got back to the office, took a smartphone apart, put it in a vacuum chamber, found that it still worked, and decided to uh, build a CubeSat around it. They needed a better uh, radio uh, and antenna to get the signal back to Earth, so they stopped off at Home Depot and bought a tape measure, which you can see in this photograph, because why? Well, everything has got to be this size when it's launched, so they just have a little motor on the tape measure, and runs the antenna up. How cool is that, okay? Total cost, I think for this, a couple of grand, maybe. You know, that was it. And they set it up, and it sent photographs back for three days before the battery ran out. That's not bad. So, proof of concept. Well, the Ardusat folks, um, which is a recent uh, development out of Salt Lake City, had a different idea. And their idea was that kids in school should be able to program satellites and gather data. Um, now, the woman who started the company used to work for an ILS company, Integrated Learning Systems type companies. We all know about those. And then one day she took a look at her own daughter's science curriculum and decided that it sucked. Um, and she said, you know what? I'm not an educator, but I can do better than that. So she quit her job and started this company because space was something that was interesting across gender lines. 
and across grade levels. And this venture just sprang because of parent concern about her own daughter's science education. That's not bad. So, when we think about our students, these uh, satellites, and um, by the way, the abstract is wrong, uh, they're about 600 to 700 kilometers up. And what's important here is to realize these are not simulations. I used to do simulation stuff. If you've heard me in the past talking about educational holodecks and things like that, those were all simulations. I'm 72 years old. I don't do simulations anymore. If it's not a real mission, I'm not interested. So this is real stuff. And students design and test Arduino projects on Earth. How many of you are familiar with the Arduino board? That's the main board in the satellite. And so kids are able to take these boards that are normally hooked up as peripherals to computers, write programs to make measurements from sensors, and have that data streamed and sent back to Earth. So um, that's what it's all about. Now this is called a demosat. This is an earthbound version of what's up there, missing some parts. But uh, it's got the main sensors, and in fact, people are taking this and hooking it up to weather balloons and sending this very thing up to a height of 30,000 and gathering data and getting it, uh, getting it shipped back. So even if you don't do an experiment in space, you know, you can still do cool stuff with this. Um, now the ones that are launched, they just had four go up a few weeks ago. So there's five up there now. Uh, there's going to be 22 more by the end of the year and by 2017, 100 satellites each one capable of running 15 simultaneous student projects. That's a lot, okay? So this is the assembly room where uh, this one's being built, and it's a three-unit CubeSat. So it's 10 by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters. And this is what it looks like from space, a photograph from the International Space Station. Um, and it's got these solar cells on it, which are kind of cool. And the thing is, well, how do, everything's got to be folded up when it's launched. Because what they do is they hitch rides on rockets that are putting other satellites up. And then when they're at the right altitude, door opens and these get pushed out. But they have to be 10 by 10 centimeters. So they take a piece of fishing line and they tie the solar cells together and then have a resistor. And after it's pushed out, the resistor heats up, burns through the fishing line, and boom, out come the solar cells. How cool is that? By the way, uh, they experimented in the early days uh, using bubble wrap to push out the um, satellites because the rocket was pressurized. But then when you open the door, it's not but the bubble wrap explosions weren't consistent enough, so now they use springs. As you can see, it's very high-tech stuff going on. If you go to Wolfram Alpha and you type in lemur, L-E-M-U-R-1, you will see the current location of the satellite that I just showed you the picture of. Um, it's tooling along at about seven and a half kilometers per second, and Actually, the final orbit for that one is between 600 and uh, 700 kilometers. Pretty good height. Still lower, low Earth orbit. And these things stay up for about two years, and there's finally enough air friction to make them come down. And at that point, they completely vaporize, and new ones get launched that are better than the old ones. Uh, NASA doesn't let you put anything up you can't get back down. Good idea. Um, and every satellite has to have a name. Why these are called lemurs, I have no idea. Uh, the company that makes them is Spire in San Francisco, and they chose the name. Now, the Arduino, for those of you who don't know about it, is an inexpensive, open-source microcontroller. 
Um, it can turn on lights, motors, things like that. It can read sensors. Um, we can accumulate data, send it. Uh, it's versatile. It's 25 bucks, uh, easy to use, and has all kinds of digital and analog inputs and outputs. So that's what a typical Arduino looks like. Now, Roger Wagner, how many of you know Roger Wagner? Okay. Did something brilliant. He said, for most kids, hooking up stuff to an Arduino isn't that easy. So he created something he calls Hyperduino that plugs into the Arduino and eliminates the need for lots of resistors and other components because they're all built into this thing. So all you have to do is think about sensors and lights and stuff like that. Um, we've been experimenting and we find that the Hyperduino is compatible with the Arduisat project. <clears throat> if you make a couple of software changes, uh, which we've done, and it's great. Because what it does is it lowers the age at which kids can start doing stuff. Now, the real serious programming language for the Arduino is called processing. It's very much like Java. And most people start by modifying existing programs. But in fact, the software, uh, there's, there's a software package that I've got downloaded here that reads all the sensors, and so you don't need any extra programming. You just decide what sensors you're going to uh, collect data from. And so you don't even have to program for some stuff. <clears throat> the final satellite has got a bunch of sensors in it. We won't do that. Temperature, luminosity, infrared, ultraviolet, inertial measurements, a barometer, and visual and infrared cameras. The barometer is also on the um, satellites in orbit, but it's kind of boring. And so you think, well, if I have a barometer and I'm doing a balloon experiment, I can take barometric pressure and I can convert that to altitude, right? Well, there's a nice physics lesson right there. You take Pascal's law, which technically doesn't work in air, but um, we'll... Uh, forget that for a moment, and you can do a conversion. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, and a good science activity for kids to do. So the idea is that using tools like this, all the rest of the science curriculum that we're teaching kids fits in very smoothly. <clears throat> As I said, it's got visual and infrared cameras. <clears throat> now, of course, all these sensors have to be pointed down towards the Earth, right? Well, when you push this thing out, it's kind of tumbling around in space. So how does it orient so it's pointing towards the Earth? Well, here's what they do. The Earth's magnetic field at those altitudes is still about 200 microteslas, which is plenty enough um, for compass needles and things like that. Uh, here's the temperature sensor. These are all off-the-shelf sensors you can get. Uh, this is the uh, visible light sensor. Uh, there's the infrared sensor. Um, there's the ultraviolet sensor. Um, this one measures a ton of things, and one-third of that uh, capsule that I did in 1961 is done on that one board, which is either exciting or depressing you know, depending where you are. It could be both. Um, so, and these are inexpensive parts. The Arduisat website has lots of Creative Commons and public domain materials that you can download, use with your students, uh, including some videos and some projects. And the process is to start with an interesting question, uh, start with a project on Earth, ship the experiment to the satellite, receive the data, and analyze the results. Uh, this is a teacher in Irvine, uh, and some of his students, um, who was one of the early adopters of, of this program, and he's holding his demo sat. And, uh, they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff with it. So 
Um, and he was able to get money from the foundation, the school's foundation, to pay for the program. It's not that much. So as I said, the recent launch had four satellites with the two cameras, and the plans are 22 more by 2016, 100 uh, by 2017. Student projects start this year, November, December. The cost for an entire school, entire school, is only $5,000 a year. Now, if we take a look at next generation science standards, what have we got? Well, there's disciplinary core ideas, um, there's how scientists and engineers work, and there's transferability. Those are the three main elements. <laughs> there are four disciplinary core ideas. Earth and space sciences, life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering and technology. This addresses all four of those, right? How scientists and engineers work includes inquiry and projects. Again, this does it. Transferability into mathematics, other disciplines. Sure, you've got that too. In other words, this one project addresses every aspect of the next generation science standards. I mean, if you just did this, as far as your district's concerned, you're golden. Now, basically, the core of NGSS is moving from knowing to doing. We're going from nouns to verbs. There is some wonderful work on that topic by David Schaefer at the University of Wisconsin called The Theory of Epistemic Frames. Um, now, this, uh, this woman that you see in this photograph, uh, any guess as to uh, what she does for a living? I beg your pardon? Uh, motivates people? Mm. Yeah, I'd say, yes, absolutely. Um, she doesn't see herself as a motivational speaker, though. Uh, any other guesses? Well, I'll tell you. She's an interplanetary volcanologist. She studies volcanoes and other planets. Um, this is uh, Dr. Rosalie Lopez, who's uh, at JPL, and she's on our board of, our board of directors and a really good person. Um, she carries five things in her, uh, in her kit at all times. She has her knowledge and her skills. She has her values, her identity, and her epistemology, her ways of thinking. Now, knowledge and skills are external things. That's the stuff we typically teach, but we don't necessarily focus on values, identity, and epistemology. And the downside of that is that we've got kids who score high on math tests and have absolutely no idea why there are people who, as one child said to me once, get up in the morning and do math on purpose. You know, not because it's required, but because it's something that's desirable. And I think we need to fix that, and the Next Generation Science Standards agrees. So that brings me to an epistemic frame story. A mathematician, physicist, and engineer are having lunch. And at the end of lunch, the uh, uh, waitress comes over and hands them the check. And they each pull out a sheet of paper and a pencil and start scribbling. And the mathematician says, I have just proven that this check can be split by a non-integer number of people. And the physicist said, that doesn't help us. He said, I've got an answer, a numerical answer, but it only applies if we had lunch in a complete vacuum. And the engineer said, it's 1850 a piece, and that includes tip. So that's my epistemic frame joke. Um, and when I give this at different conferences, I watch to see where the chuckles are, and that tells me who's in my audience. So in the case of these satellites, what kinds of questions require a space experiment to answer? 
Well, that's a lovely conversation to have with students right there. Okay. Um, and also, all questions have limitations based on hardware. Even, even big satellites have limits. Let me give you an example. Dr. Rosalie Lopez um, on the Galileo mission uh, was going to look for volcanoes on Io, uh, which is a moon of, of Jupiter, and the high gain antenna wouldn't deploy from the satellite. Now you don't send a repair team out to fix that, so they rewrote the software to use other antennas, and as a result, you see that blue thing sticking out the lower left of a very active volcano. Uh, and she's since found many, many more uh, like that. But software can sometimes do the trick. And so the idea that all kids are sending is software is not a limitation. Now, you start with a driving question in project-based learning. And what are the attributes? Well, number one, you don't already know the answer. Uh, the answers are defensible. The focus is on causes, not surface knowledge. It leads to in-depth research, cuts across grade levels, and other questions emerge. So it's an ongoing process. And this is something that um, can be taught to kids, how to come up with these and so that they start formulating really good questions. Questions that have yes, no answer, not so much. You know, if I say what time is it, for example, you give me the answer, we're done. But if we ask a question like, what's the temperature of space, and what does that even mean? Well, now that's a very different kind of question, right? Very different kind of question. So. Um, Boeing, who's celebrating their 100th anniversary uh, this year, uh, Norman and I went to a conference in St. Louis uh, at the old McDonald plant that Boeing now owns, and uh, they have an engineering design process, uh, professionals, that applies in education really well, which is you start with the question, the need or the problem, uh, you do the research, you brainstorm, select the best solution, build a prototype, test it, uh, present the results, and then redesign. It's, it's a loop, okay? And that's basically the scientific method. Something that we teach kids, but now we can have them actually do it, which is more exciting. Um, by the way, when we were there, um, Norm and I got to... Uh, see the, the Mercury a sp space capsule? How many of you saw the Astronaut Wives Club series on TV? Wasn't that great? And Norm is reading the book right now also, um, and it's all true stuff. If you haven't seen the series, it's a mini-series, 10 episodes, and I think, I'm sure it'll be rebroadcast. So uh, you might be interested in seeing it. But the mercury capsule is tiny, and I can't imagine how anybody would fit in that thing. So we learned how they did the chair for the mercury capsule. Um, McDonald himself walked into the lab one day, and he asked one of the engineers to get on the table on his hands and knees, covered him in cellophane, and poured plaster around his back, and made a cast that's the cast for the seat on the mercury capsule. So you see the scientific process at work here. It's just, and, and there are tons of stories like that. Yeah, the Russians did the same thing, but they used mud. I'll take plaster. So uh, we got to see that. We got to see the Gemini uh, capsule a little bit bigger. Um, pretty cool stuff. So, um, examples of questions. How does the camera just always face the Earth? As students do research on that, they'll come across magnetism as a way. 
And then that can lead to interesting things like, why does the Earth have a magnetic field? Do all planets have magnetic fields? Why or why not? Right? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I also mentioned this one. How can we measure the temperature of space, and what does that even mean? You know, if there's nothing there, how could exchange heat with anything? You know, I mean, that's... Um, that's an interesting question. Um, and again, you can, Google will take you only so far, and then you've got to start digging deeper into the stuff. So these are moderately Google-proof, not completely, but moderately Google-proof questions. Now, the experiment toolkit that uh, RDSAT provides has some tabs. This is being changed, but there's a tab for the hypothesis, uh, for your procedure, for data, and for analysis, and conclusion is going to be separated into its own tab, and very importantly, they're going to be adding a tab for um, citations, because we have to teach kids early on the importance of citing their sources. And each one of those tabs opens up a word processor, a window of its own that you can put in text, uh, pictures, even videos if you want. Um, and then this gets saved um, as a uh, file on the cloud. You could decide if it's public or private. So teachers have access to the student's work in this portfolio. And students can share it with their peers, whatever they want to do. Also, a student leaves school, goes someplace else, they still have access to their cloud. So they can always get this wherever they are. And I think that's neat. The other modification we've asked them to consider is to be able to export this as a PDF file, um, which is, you know, because sometimes PDF is the right format to use to distribute something. And they're looking into that. So the idea is, instead of learning about the scientific method, they're actually doing it, all right? And I think that's really cool. So here's some data from an experiment that uh, said, what is the relationship between altitude and air temperature? This is a balloon experiment. The hypothesis was that the higher you went, the lower the temperature would go. And so here you see altitude on one axis and balloon uh, temperature data on the other. And it starts to go down for a while, then it turns around and goes up. Well, isn't that interesting? Uh, now, here we've got altitude over time and temperature over time. So it's tempting to say, well, then we can plot altitude versus temperature. But are those numbers just correlated, or is there a causal connection? Now, this is sort of stuff that you learn when you study uh, science in college. It is now part of the K-12 curriculum. It's part of NGSS. So here's an opportunity to say, Okay, what's your rationale for thinking that there's a causal relationship? And that's a nice teachable moment, right? Uh, so this is very rich stuff. Um, also, you can take the data sets that come back and export them into a format that is used uh, by Excel and do your own plots. Um, and it's, it's great. I mean, everything is available to you in a format that you already know. So they've really thought that part through pretty nicely. When experiments are done, they show up on a map, and if you click, see like over here it says 13, if you click on that, you drill down into different experiments, and then, and I'll show this to you later, you can get to the data sets themselves and whatnot, and we have time to uh, demonstrate some of this, so we'll do that. So, going back to how we started, 
talking about Hurricane Patricia. The question that I have for you is, what do you think would have a greater impact on students reading about hurricanes in a textbook or Johnny or Susie saying, oh, I'd like to show a photograph I took of Hurricane Patricia uh, from satellite in space. And here's the data along with it of various things I could measure. Obviously, that's going to have a bigger impact. And that's what's going, that's what gets so exciting about this project. Because that's all within the realm of the possible. I think it's going to stimulate a bigger interest in science in kids. And I think that's, there's a lot to be said for that. So um, what I'm going to do now is demo a couple of things. And then uh, we can take some questions. And then you can fill out those forms. Uh, and we'll uh, have our drawing. Uh, if you want to be in touch, uh, there's my email address. And so um, you can write to me. And there's our blog, which is about a lot of different things. So encourage you to uh, enjoy that. Wolfram Alpha, how many of you use that tool? Isn't that cool? They haven't got the new satellites in it yet, but um, here is where that uh, original satellite is right now, that, that red dot. You want data about it. Um, there's its altitude, um, transmission delay, Velocity, as I said, seven and a half kilometers per second, et cetera. When it was launched, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I can also uh, take a look at this from a different perspective. I can do a, uh, well, let's do 3D. So there's the orbit you know, around, around the Earth. And that's handy for kids because when you look at this plot, it's, unless you're used to looking at maps like this, it's deceiving because you think, oh, the satellite's changing direction? No, that's just what it looks like in this view. And as you can see, this is not a good time to be looking for Hurricane Patricia uh, because it, it's not getting close in any of the upcoming orbits. But, the likelihood is, with a bunch of satellites up there, one of them is going to be pretty close. And you specify the latitude and longitude of the area you want to explore, and it'll take you there. So, that is that. Let's now show you the next thing. This is actually wireless. I could be a mile away with this right now. Uh, but I don't have the interface transmitter. So we're going to look at existing data sets. Here are some locations of different experiments, high altitude balloon data. Um, there should be a, I'm going to do an experiment using an existing data set. So I'll give it a name. I can type in a description, uh, set it to be public or private, create it. And now here are those tabs I was telling you about. So under hypothesis, see I've got a text editor. I can enter stuff and say what is it that I think this experiment's going to show. I can click on this tab, talk about the procedure I'm going to use to make the measurements. Click on this tab and choose the data set. So I click on add data set and I'll choose this one. And then if I go here, what it will do is it'll show me all the data that was collected 
on that balloon launch, but the, um, the ones that I might be interested in, not this stuff, that's kind of boring. But you see all these different sensors uh, are producing data. So the gyroscope, for example, um, I mean, this thing's being blown around in the wind. So you expect that to be uh, giving you stuff. And then we've got the infrared temperature versus the ordinary temperature measurement. Okay, so now I've got these data sets. And as I said, uh, this data is now available for me to uh, uh, replot, you know, to do other things with, and then go into the last tab over here for the analysis of the data uh, and the conclusions, uh, which the conclusions down here, it's going to be a separate tab uh, that, you would, that you would do. So as I said before, it's not just teaching kids about scientific method, it's having them actually use it. And that internalizes, internalizes the idea. Uh, if you already have an Arduino and some of these sensors, then you can download the software uh, to do that stuff but you could also buy one of these already made, or you can buy for a hundred bucks or so, a couple hundred bucks, a kit that lets you make your own, basically. Um, so um, what the $5,000 does is gives an entire school license for all the software, plus some hardware, for Earth, plus access to the real satellites. Well, I have to say, I'm so thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be sharing about something that I didn't do, but that I believe in very strongly. Um, and to me, the critical part of all of this is the staff development. Sarah Armstrong, Norma, and I are the developers of staff development multi-day program around all this to help teachers in your schools get ready for this kind of stuff because this is and and oh by the way that also gets you ready for NGSS at the same time which you've got to do anyway and I don't know if you know this but uh, the state of California is making in December 500 million dollars available for staff development, okay? And one of the subject areas it can be used for is da, 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 next generation science standards. So uh, you've got my email address, and if, uh, as, as your interest grows, um, you know, stay in touch. And also we have a drawing, and if you fill out those forms and put your email address on there, then that'll be great. I'm not going to abuse your email address. I hate it when people do that to me. Um, but if you say that you're interested in this, I will pass that information on to the RDSAT folks because I don't get involved in the minutia of, you know, how do you sign up for this thing? That's their job. I just am proselytizing the idea behind it. I mean, how many of you think this is just almost too cool to be true. That's just, you know, I mean, it takes a lot. I've been in this business since the late 70s. And before that, I was the research scientist at Xerox Palo Research Center. It takes a lot to make my jaw go slack, okay? The wound is still healing from my jaw hitting the table on this one. I just can't believe it. And the fact that it was done by people who care so passionately about our children 
is just heartening, really heartening. So I thank you so much for your attention today and wish you the very best of the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. And thank you, Norma, for making it possible.